that this is the great good news of this chapter. Jesus Christ brings victory over death. Thanks be to God, Paul says, verse 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. We will rise with him. Quite unexpectedly, the drummer of the band, the Foo Fighters, leading rock band, passed away. He's just 50. How many other people died unexpectedly this last week? Gentlemen, many of us used to know who come to our coffee morning here, passed away, we heard, back in February. We didn't realise at the time. Did they rise? Did they live? Will they rise when Christ returns? Do they have life beyond the grave? Well, this particular gentleman from our coffee morning, we'd spoken with him, some of us, a number of times. We'd explained to him what we believe as Christians. He listened to talks here in this place. I guess he knew where we were coming from. It didn't seem that it was particularly something he, he, he wanted. He seemed to have a kind of religion of his own that he'd worked out, a sort of combination of Buddhism and Hinduism and stuff. But who knows, in the last days of his life, who knows whether he came to understand and believe and accept that Christ is the one who gives life to the dead. Who knows? We hope. Because certainly, what we've seen in this chapter is wonderful news. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Because Christ is risen, we will rise in a glorious new world. Let me take a moment just to go back through 1 Corinthians 15 with you and look back over the ground we've covered. It's been a number of weeks, hasn't it, that we've been in this chapter. In the first 11 verses, Paul is reminding them of certain things. He's saying, do you not remember the fundamentals that we covered together? Do you not remember that I told you Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures? That's fundamental. He was buried. He rose on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul isn't telling them anything new. He's taken them back through the stuff that he first preached in that town and explained to them. Just to make sure they understand and they're convinced, he goes through certain people who saw Jesus Christ alive. He says, this one saw Christ alive and they saw Christ. They knew that he rose from the dead. You should believe what I'm saying because we've got eyewitness testimony. Christ is risen. And that is the message, Paul says, that all of us preach, 1511. But in 1512, we get to the, the heart of the disagreement because some of the people in that church were saying, there's no resurrection of the dead. There's nothing. Live your life. Enjoy your life. Live your best life now because that's all you're going to get. Make the most of it. You live. You follow Christ. Christ is good to you. You die. That's the end. And Paul said, how could you say that? Christ has been raised. He said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, Christ has not been raised. And it's all in vain. Everything's in vain. There's nothing. There's no one to believe in. There's no Christian faith. It's all in vain. Verses 12 to 20. Those who've fallen asleep in Christ, verse 18, have perished. They're in hell today if Christ has not been raised. But he comes back to the positive. Yes, in fact, Christ has been raised, verse 20. And he sets up this contrast then between Christ and Adam. Do you remember this? Adam, the first man, he brought death into the world. Sin led to death. For Adam and all his descendants, all of us, all the children of Adam, sin and death. As in Adam, all die, verse 22. So in Christ, all shall be made alive. Everyone who belongs to Adam dies and perishes eternally. Everyone who belongs to Christ will rise. This is the great contrast, the two heads of the human race, the two people, you belong to one or the other, Adam or Christ. And that determines your eternal destiny. Do you belong to Adam? I asked you this question in the sermon. I ask it again now. Do you belong to Adam? Or do you belong to Christ? But he gives us a timeline on this as we go through these verses, just summarizing them. There's the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of those who belong to him. And those two things are one event. Those two things are one event, the rising of the people of God. But to our human understanding, they're separated by quite a long interval, 2,000 years and counting. But from God's perspective, it's all the same thing. The first one has risen, 
many others will rise. The first one rose 2,000 years ago, then we will rise with him at the end of time when he returns. It's all part of the same thing, and the one guarantees the other. Because Christ is risen, we will rise. It's all part of the same event in the plan and purposes of God. And then there's some discussion about the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ and the authority he exercises now compared to the situation when he returns. Going down through to verse 28, verse 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, some practical applications of this. What, what is your life? Is your life a life of safety first, preserv- preservation, health, or is it Christ? Which leads Paul to a life of risks and danger. But then, as we saw last week, someone pops up with this question, I think rather a sceptical question, not an honest or a humble question, but the question of somebody who wants to attack the whole idea. How will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? I think this is somebody poo-pooing the whole thing and dismissing it. Not a load of nonsense. And Paul answers that, as we saw in some detail last week, going through the fact that the resurrection body is the same body But it's different. It's like a seed and a tree. The seed is tiny, the tree is massive, but they're still the same plant. So he explains to us our resurrection body will be very different from the body we have now. It will have all kinds of powers and abilities that we don't have now. It will be beyond all the physical limitations and frailties, weaknesses, pain and ill health that we experience in these flesh and blood bodies that are ours. And so we come down to verse 50 in our passage for today. We need to be changed for the kingdom of God. This body that we have now cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This perishable body is not fit for life in the imperishable world that's to come. Just worth perhaps a momentary detour to talk a little bit more about the kingdom of God. What will the future be like then? What's so special about this future world? We understand we're going to have new bodies. How will the new world be different from this world? I'm going to ask you to find a scripture with me in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. Isaiah 25, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. And I'll just give you just one of these passages where we just get a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth. This is why we'll need new resurrection bodies in order to live in this coming world, the world that's beyond the world we live in now, the world that God will bring in the future when Christ returns. Isaiah 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. Doesn't that sound good? There'll be a banquet it would be a feast. it would be good things. We'll sit down at table together with all God's people. What a joy that will be. It'll be like a, a, a wedding or some tremendously happy occasion like that. Well, you say, well, we have weddings and feasts now. Yes, that's true. But listen to this, verse 7. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. So we're asked to imagine there's this kind of veil, this darkness over us. But it's going to be gone then. It's going to be swallowed up, verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. So this world is beyond death then, as we're seeing in 1 Corinthians 15. And listen to this, verse 8. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. This is the best thing about the world to come. The Lord will be there as a God of comfort, the God of consolation, the God who takes away our reproach and blame and criticism and all the attacks and controversies that we face. The Lord who comforts us for every tear that we shed. That's the world to come. And this is what we'll say on that day, verse 9. It's what you and I will say. Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad, we'll say to each other. Be glad. Rejoice in his salvation. 
But that's just a glimpse of the great world to come. I hope you're looking forward to it. That's why we need to be different physically. We can't inherit that world with these bodies. They're not ready for it. They're not right for it. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. So we're back in 1 Corinthians 15. And we're talking about this great theme of victory in Christ. Victory over death. Christ is risen. We will rise. Victory for those still alive when Christ returns, the first heading. Victory over death as the judgment of sin, the second heading. Victory, so the work of the Lord is not in vain, the third heading. Victory for those still alive when Christ returns. There will be a last generation of human beings on this planet. When Christ comes back, there will be people who are alive. Many people have said, I think the human race will end this way or that way. I think the human race will end in some new pandemic, some new virus will kill us all. Or I think the human race will end in a nuclear holocaust. One of these giant reactors will blow up or they'll launch the nuclear warheads and we'll all die. No, there'll still be people here when Christ returns. By the way, either of those things could happen. <laughs> we could have a new pandemic. We could have a nuclear holocaust. Things could get bad and terrible and horrible. There could be worldwide floods or fires or environmental catastrophes. But some of us will be left when Christ returns, regardless. It won't necessarily be a happy or a peaceful world, he finds. But there will be men and women here. There will be a last generation. And Paul tells us a mystery, verse 51, about all this. He tells us things that we wouldn't know by ourselves. He tells us things that we wouldn't figure out. He reveals things that he's learned from God. It's a secret, but God has told it to him. He's telling it to us. Here's what will happen. Those who are alive at the end will not die. We shall not all sleep. That's his word for death, the death of a Christian. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So those alive when Jesus Christ returns, suddenly will become new people without going through death. The trumpet, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. It won't be a long, drawn-out process. It won't be like when some people have plastic surgery. They have to go through all sorts of skin grafts and things. It will be instantaneous, in the twinkling of an eye. The dead will rise and we shall be changed. Verse 52. This perishable body, verse 53, will put on the imperishable. will somehow be, be clothed with these new bodies then, like putting on a suit or a shirt. The mortal will put on immortality. It's interesting, isn't it? Did Paul think he would be alive when Christ came back? Sounds like it, doesn't it? He says, we shall be changed. The dead will be raised, he says, and we shall be changed. We shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 51. So was he thinking that in his lifetime, Jesus would return? He says something similar elsewhere, um, a little bit later on in his letters. We declare to you by a word from the Lord, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. He's writing as if he's still going to be there when Christ comes back. But he wasn't. He wasn't there. He's been dead 2,000 odd years. But then again, when you question the scriptures, you have to make sure you have all the scriptures. <laughs> Paul did say that. He wrote that as if he'd be alive when Christ returned. But elsewhere, he writes as if he's going to die. So when he's in prison in Rome, he writes to the Philippians. He said, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What will it be for me? I cannot tell. I'm happy to depart and be with the Lord. So he's talking there as if he's going to be killed, not as if Christ's going to return first. And then in the last letter he wrote in 2 Timothy, he makes it clear that he is on the point of death. His life is about to end. He's about to be executed. I'll leave you to look that up and read that. 
So sometimes he's talking as if Christ's going to return in his lifetime. Sometimes he's talking as if he's going to die before Christ returns. The point is, I guess, he didn't know. He just didn't know. He didn't know. There's no reason why Christ shouldn't have returned during his lifetime. There's no reason why Christ shouldn't have come back while he was still alive. He had that expectation, that sense of the imminent return of Christ. He thought to himself, I could well be among the last generation of human beings on planet Earth before the return of Christ. It could happen next week, he said to himself. Or I could die and leave this world as many already have. He didn't know which it was going to be. And surely, friends, there's a lesson for us in that, isn't there? Shouldn't we have that same expectation that Christ is on the point of returning? He is on the point of returning. Maybe it will be next week. See, we tend to measure out our lives, don't we? Uh, We've got health care, and we've got doctors, and we've got prognoses, and you can look on websites to see what's wrong with you, if anything, and you can say, well, basically, I'm fit and healthy, so, you know, I'll probably live to be 70 or 80, maybe even 90. Don't know for sure, but, you know, quite probably, I'll go on for quite a few years yet, we say to ourselves. And maybe that's true. But don't discount the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ might return while you're still fit and healthy. He might appear and it all might be suddenly over for you and everybody else. Don't assume you've got many years to come. You might not have, might get run over, something terrible like that. Or Christ might return. We need to get this sense that this could happen at any point. Some of us read the the Evangelical Times uh, Stuart Olliott's a commentator in there. He's a preacher. He's an old man. He's been around a long time. And in, in his column, he was asked, what's the difference between the evangelical Christians now and when you were younger? And he compares the two. And he says, well, you know, there's some things good about the churches now. But he says, when we were young, we all lived as if Christ was going to return at any moment. And he thinks that's disappeared. And it has disappeared, hasn't it, from our thinking, from our preaching. It's not something we dwell on. We should. Paul thought it could happen even in his lifetime. He was ready for it. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. Older generations of mothers would say to their children, do you want to be doing that when Jesus returns? It was a way of telling them off, you see, if they were doing something they shouldn't be doing. You don't want to be doing that when Christ returns. And so they bred into their children from a young age the imminent return of Christ. We, as I've said, tend to think we've got years ahead of us. It ain't necessarily so. The question is, are you ready to meet Christ at any time? (coughs) Victory over death is ours in Christ. Verse 56, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. So if death is some giant monster, some monster-sized scorpion, you know scorpions, they've got this tail with a, a sting. Even a tiny scorpion can kill you, can't it? If it jabs you with that tail. But imagine some massive monster-sized scorpion with this horrible sting. Death is the scorpion and the sting is sin. In other words, it's sin that makes death so bad. Sin is the reason why you don't want to die if you can possibly help it. Sin is the reason why you'll say to the doctor, by all means, don't let me die. Resuscitate me. Do anything to keep me alive. Sin is the sting of death. Because the problem with death, the one thing you can't be confident of leaving behind outside of Christ is your sins. You leave everything else behind. You leave your family behind. You leave your home behind. You leave your car behind. You leave your money behind. You leave your achievements behind. But your sins, you take them with you into the presence of a holy God. Outside of Christ, they all go with you. And you find then, if you haven't understood before, you will find out then from bitter experience that not one of them has been forgotten. Not one. When you leave this life and stand before the God of infinite holiness, majesty and glory, the God who is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. Every single one is there. 
laid there before him. Not one of them as he waved aside and said, don't worry about that. Not one of them as he said, well, you know, I understand why you did that. Not one of them as he said, well, let's just forget about that just between us. Every single one comes into the account. What a thought. What a thought. The sting of death is sin. And people who understand this, even just dimly in their consciences, just dimly realize there's something after death to avoid. People do everything they can to hang on to life here and to avoid that reckoning. Is there some treatment I can have, some operation? I know it's got a limited chance of access, but give it to me. I, I can't leave this world and take these sins with me. I can't appear before God to answer for all these things. Understand that even, even the things we did as children come into this. One dear woman I remember was about my age actually when she became a Christian. She was so happy to hear that Jesus died for sins. She was so happy to hear that he paid for it all. She was just delighted and thrilled because she remembered that when she was a girl she'd been mean to one of her family pets. And she lived with that horrible guilt all through her life. Well, if it wasn't for Jesus and his death, she'd be appearing in God's presence to answer for that. And many other things besides. We all would. Another young woman, delightful young woman, married to a Christian man from a Christian home. She gave her testimony to join the church. She explained something similar, that uh, when she'd been at home with her sisters, her younger sisters, She'd been cruel to them. You say, well, that's, that's normal. That's just what happens in families. People fight all the time. Brothers and sisters fight all the time. But she knew it was wrong. And she felt it, even as a grown woman. She felt the guilt of it and the weight of it. And again, she was so glad that the sting of death is drawn. Jesus and his death for us on the cross. Victory over death as the judgment on sin. That's what makes death so bad, isn't it? The judgments. But look, even in verse 56, it's even intensified when you consider the law of God. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. We understand that God has laid out for us clear instructions on what is right and what is wrong. He spelt it out. We need not be in any doubt about it. We need not be scratching our heads and say, well, yes, I know I'm married to her, but it really feels right to go with her. I wonder if it's right. No, God has given us teaching that we can understand what's right and wrong in all these things. He's given us his law. Here's the difference it makes, I think. Imagine you live in a country where there's no speed limits. There's a law about driving, and the law just says, drive sensibly and safely. That's all it says. So some people will drive through town at 20 miles an hour. Some people will drive at 30. Some people will drive at 40. Some people will even say to themselves, it's sensible and safe to drive at 60 miles an hour through town. There's no law to say that's foolish and wrong. I mean, it is foolish and wrong, but there's no law against it. There's an ambiguity. There's gray areas. I don't really know what's right. But once the law comes in, 30 miles an hour, you know where you stand. You can still drive at 60 miles an hour, but now you know you're a lawbreaker. You know you're guilty. You know you're in trouble if you get caught. Just so with God's law, it's spelt out. Here's what's right. Here's what's wrong. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. But that by itself never helped anybody. That by itself never changed anybody. Telling somebody they're doing wrong never made anybody a better person. It just built resentment, bad feeling. So the sting of death is sin, yes. And sin gets its power, ironically, from the law of God. Paul puts it this way elsewhere. Law came in to increase the trespass. The law of God made us sin more, not less. What a state we'd be in if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just yesterday in the town I saw a bus and it had on the side the advert for a new children's film. Good is boring, it said. Looked like it was some kind of cartoon film. I can't tell you the name. 
Well, yes, for sinful men and women, good is boring. For men and women who love what's bad, who hate God, who hate God's law, good is boring. But when you consider you've got to die and appear before God, bad is terrifying. It's terrifying. Thanks be to God, Paul says, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death has been drawn by Jesus in his death and resurrection. So let me quote to you from a hymn that explains this. Why all my fear and unbelief? Has not the Father put to grief his spotless Son for me? Will the righteous judge of men condemn me for that debt of sin discharged at Calvary? Complete atonement you have made, to the utmost limit paid, all that your people owed. How can God's wrath my soul distress if sheltered in your righteousness and covered by your blood? Turn then my soul to joy and rest. What a great victory it is that Christ has won over sin and death so that we can face the future with confidence knowing that Christ has risen and we will rise. One writer has put it this way. If sin is pardoned, death is harmless. It can inflict no evil. It becomes a mere transition to a better and happier state. So again, the question to ask at this point is is clear, obvious. Do you belong to Christ? Do you belong to Christ? Can you say that you've been given the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say that your faith is in him, that you are his? Well, thirdly, verse 58. Victory, so the work of God is not in vain. My brothers, my beloved brothers, Paul says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now what is the work of the Lord in this verse? I believe in this verse the work of the Lord is something specific. See, anything you do can be a case of serving the Lord. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as serving the Lord, not men knowing from the Lord Christ you'll receive your reward. So you can do your daily job as serving the Lord. You can say to yourself as you, as you turn up to work, I'm serving Jesus Christ here. I'm going to do my job well because that will honour the Lord. I'm going to work hard all day. I'm not going to be a man pleaser. I'm going to do my job properly. That's part of my service of Christ, working for the Lord. You can do that at home as well. As a homemaker, when you're looking after small children, you can serve the Lord in whatever you're given to do. But the work of the Lord is something more specific than that. In chapter 16, verse 10, Paul says of Timothy, you should treat him with respect because he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. What is that work of the Lord? I believe that what Paul's talking about here is the work of teaching, preaching, holding out the word of life. Anything that helps people spiritually in their relationship with God. Anything that shows people Jesus Christ. Anything that brings the word of Christ to people is the work of the Lord. Matthew chapter 9, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And he meant people who would tell others about Jesus in the harvest field of the Lord. Workers are those who go and proclaim Jesus Christ. And he said there are not enough people doing it, so pray for more. Pray for more people to do the work of the Lord. It's not just among people who aren't Christians. It's also a case of building up people who are Christians. It goes on in churches as well as outside. So Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said to them, 
We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So he's talking about their elders and pastors and preachers, and he says they're laboring, they're doing the work of the Lord in your church. Elsewhere again, in 1 Timothy, he talks about people who labor in preaching and teaching, doing the work of the Lord. So when Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be abounding in the work of the Lord, he means gospel work, word ministry. Here's a quote. By the work of the Lord, the apostle understands labor for the spread of salvation and the development of spiritual life. And so he says to the Corinthians, do this work, do this work, do this kind of work. Don't give up, be steadfast. Don't give up easily, don't stop. Be immovable, have a commitment to this kind of work. Don't be put off, don't be discouraged. Be always overflowing in the work of the Lord. Don't be stingy. Don't be cutting off and say, well, I can't manage this and I can't do that and I need to watch telly on that night and and so on. Be steadfast be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And the problem, of course, with that is that it seems very often that the work of the Lord doesn't really achieve anything. It seems that the work of the Lord is an empty thing. You can do the work of the Lord and pour your heart and soul into it and seem to get nowhere at all. You can talk to a friend about the Lord Jesus Christ and get to the point where they don't want to hear any more at all, so you have to stop talking about that, or else stop being their friend. And you think, well, I've made no impression on them whatsoever. But Paul says, in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Because Christ is risen. Because Christ has conquered death. Because we will rise. This stuff is never a waste of time. Never. Although it often feels... Like that's exactly what it is. So at our, our church in Watford, Clive, dear brother in Christ, is with the Lord now. Every week he'd come home from work, Friday evening he'd grab a bite to eat and come out again to the church hall, open up, he'd set up a pool table, table tennis, about a quarter to eight there, about six or eight teenage lads would slope in. They'd play uh, table tennis in a rather desultory kind of way or occasionally they'd have a very violent game of football in the hall. And then at some point... Clive would have to try and calm them down and shepherd them through into the back and get them all to sit down so he could give them the talk that he'd spent time preparing that week. The times I went, I'm not really convinced anyone particularly listened to the talk. They didn't seem to be listening. They seemed to be poking each other in the ribs and whispering little things to each other and so on. But Clive stuck at this week after week, week after week, until they were all too cold to come to the club and drifted away. Did it achieve anything? We never saw any of those guys in church. None of them ever asked for a Bible. None of them ever asked a question about the state of their soul, their relationship with the Lord. It would be easy to think it achieved nothing at all. But Paul says here, your labor is not in vain. That kind of thing is never a waste of time. Even if it seems like it's done nothing and gone nowhere, it's not in vain. A pastor friend of mine very dedicated preacher, spent hours preparing his sermon for his church, going into the Bible, studying it, working out how to explain things, turned up on Sunday and preached his sermon in the morning service, all about how to relate together and how to love each other and serve each other and care for each other in the body of Christ. 10, 15 minutes after he'd finished and people were having tea, an argument broke out, another argument, yet another argument. Voices were raised. People were saying hard things. And he felt as if he needn't have bothered speaking. He felt as if he could just walk out through the door and never come back. He was just so upset that it seemed that it was such a waste of time, everything he'd said. But his labor in the Lord was not in vain. I can't prove to you chapter and verse of this happened and that happened as a result of that sermon, no. But what I do know here in the Bible is that labor for the Lord is never in vain. Never in vain. A friend of mine's been attempting to start a new church in South London. There's a massive housing estate, new homes being built. So a group of churches got together and said, we we should start a church on that estate as the homes are built. Uh, They bought a house there on the estate. 
and they paid for a couple to go and move in and supported them full time to work on the estate to start a new church. Well, 12 years later, they've had meetings in their home, they've had people come into their home for worship, they've got to know people, they've talked to people about the Lord, they've run community events like Easter egg hunts and such things, um, they've done one-to-one -one Bible studies with a few people, but they've decided after 12 years it's not happening. There's not going to be a church. It's not working. The people who come into the home all come from off the estate. They haven't really seen anyone from the estate itself come and join them for Sunday worship. And they haven't seen anyone become a Christian. So they're ending the project. And that may well be the right decision. It's not necessarily the case that you should keep on doing the same thing when perhaps your energy and resources could be put elsewhere. That may well be the right decision. But they need to know that everything they did for the Lord was not wasted. It was not empty. It was not futile. The Lord's work is never done in vain. That's what he says to us. We don't understand that. We don't see that. But in glory, in the resurrection, we will see that. And we say, well, I was part of that. And that meant this and this. And I never knew that. And so this happened because I did that. And I'm amazed. And it wasn't in vain. But we need to see it now. We need to know it now. We need to understand it now. Because now, here in this world, we need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always overflowing with this gospel work. Don't be put off. Don't be put off. Thinking about this verse this week and trying to understand it myself has made me more determined to be fixed and resolute. Never passive, never half-hearted always overflowing with the work of the Lord. And I hope you feel the same way, whatever opportunities you have to contribute to the cause of Christ. I hope you feel also that you want to overflow in this good work. So just in these few verses at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 then we've seen victory in Christ, victory over death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As it's been saying through this chapter, Christ is risen. Christian brother, Christian sister, believer in Christ, you will rise. And he spelt out three things for us then to know about this. First of all, the last generation, people still alive when Christ returns, they will share in the victory. We will, perhaps, if it's us. Because we'll be clothed with immortality. <coughs> and the great thing about this victory over death, secondly, is it's a victory over the judgment on sin. You don't want to die in your sins. You don't want to take your sins with you when you go. Lay them on Christ. And then, as I've just said, thirdly, victory... Victory means that the work of the Lord is not in vain. We pray.